Ever since Nintendo released the NES Mini and it sold far better than they expected, those mini nostalgia-based consoles have become a much-loved way to play retro games in an affordable and easy way. The idea is simple. Buy a small version of a console you loved as a kid with a bunch of preloaded games on them, and plug it directly via HDMI cord into your TV and boom, you have a collection of retro games at your disposal. For those only interested in playing the games who don't care so much about having a collection or playing on the original hardware, or even those who can't connect old consoles to modern TVs, this is a great means to play some old favorites. With the TurboGrafx-16 Mini now out, it's time to compare these mini consoles and see what the pros and cons are of each one, and which ones might be right for you. While I'm aware that people have found ways to mod these devices so they can add entire collections into them, it's not what I'm going to be talking about. I'm discussing the product as is. If modding is your thing, great, but I just want to take these for how they are off the shelves. The NES Classic Edition was a great mini console with 30 games. While it had many classic console games like the Mario Trilogy, the two Zelda games, Ninja Gaiden, Mega Man 2, and others, there was an emphasis on multiplayer and arcade-style games, many of which were from the Black Box Collection. While their choices like Bubble Bobble, Balloon Fight, and the two Donkey Kong games are inspired and a lot of fun, they also lack the substance that many later titles might have. The strangest thing is that, despite the emphasis on the multiplayer experience, it only came with a single controller, forcing the buyer to source out a second controller, an oddly difficult experience if you're seeking the proper functionality that only first-party controllers have. This led to many buyers having to resort to overpriced copies selling on eBay and Amazon from third-party sellers, at prices that are frankly unjustified. I was fortunate to find one at a decent price, but it was a search I feel I shouldn't have had to make, particularly since I got my NES Mini during the second wave of releases when buyers made their complaints about the console well known. On that note, the controller cord is comedically short, forcing the player to either source out a cord extension or just sit really close to the console which may not work for everyone's entertainment setup. Nevertheless, at a retail price of $60 US, this console is a great deal. It's no secret that the old NES games are extremely hard, and many adults don't have the time that they had as kids to invest into and master NES hard games. With the ability to create safe states at any moment during gameplay, making it to the end of brutally hard games like Gradius, Ninja Gaiden, and Ghosts and Goblins, doesn't seem as unreachable as if you got the original cartridges. The homepage interface is very intuitive and the music is very on brand for Nintendo. Cute, simple, and catchy. To exit gameplay, simply press the reset button on the console. Later released games like Star Tropics and Kirby's Adventure are not obvious, but excellent additions. I've been playing the original Castlevania for the first time and really enjoying it, and this is my chance to finally play through Zelda 2, which is known to be far less forgiving than the first game. Still, there are many games that could have made this feel even more complete. Missing from here is Contra, and while they have the sequel, Super C, the original is much more iconic in the hearts of NES fans. Similarly, Castlevania 3 Dracula's Curse is far more loved than the device of Simon's Quest, but it is sadly missing from this package. Other great picks would have been Bionic Commando, Blaster Master, and Adventure Island 1 and 2. Or maybe just 2 because that's the one where you get to ride the dinosaurs. While I'm sure licensing complications played a big hand in why some games were not selected, I would have loved to see DuckTales, Chippendale Rescue Rangers, Batman, and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2 the arcade game, just to name a few. But regardless, there is plenty to enjoy here and it is well worth the retail value. The Super Nintendo Classic was a bit of a different beast in its game selections. There were fewer multiplayer games on this collection, despite Nintendo rectifying their mistake and packing in two controllers with this one. The controller cords are also longer, but arguably still too short. Also, there is a downgrade in the amount of games, stranding us with a mere 20 games from one of the best video game libraries of all time. 
making this the mini console on the list with the fewest number of games. That being said, no game is wasted and they are all indispensable. Masterpieces like Super Mario World, The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past, Super Metroid, Donkey Kong Country, and Yoshi's Island are all present as well as acclaimed third-party games like Street Fighter 2, Super Castlevania 4, and Contra 3 Alien Wars. There really is nothing I'd remove here, except maybe Kirby's Dream Course, but even that one has passionate fans so maybe I just need to give it a bit more time, and it is good to have another two-player game in the mix. The interface is basically the same as the NES Classic with a different soundtrack, similarly on brand, but with more 16-bit sounding music. Of course, the big gimmick of this package was the release of Star Fox 2, the abandoned sequel of Star Fox that was finished in 1995, but left in video game purgatory for over 20 years. The inclusion of this long-lost game was brilliant in finally bringing gamers an official version of the game, so we didn't have to resort to downloading the leaked ROM. In hindsight, it did seem like a missed opportunity for Nintendo to have sat on this gem for as long as they did, but I am glad to see it here. So with only 21 games in total, I would vote for nothing to be removed, but this collection could stand to have even more. It is a head-scratcher that Donkey Kong Country 2 was omitted, since it is the preferred game by many fans. Some shooter representation would be appreciated as well with popular titles like Gradius 3 and R-Type. Those would be great candidates for this because the save feature would help make them more accessible. Chrono Trigger is also an RPG fan favorite, and Act Razor, a unique early release of the console, would have also been an inspired choice. But I would have liked to see more multiplayer games like maybe Wild Guns and Pocky and Rocky. While not overly well known titles, this would have been a great way to bring them to a new audience considering they also command a big price tag for their physical copies. And competitive puzzle games like Bust a Move and Yoshi's Cookie would put those two controllers to good use. But Nintendo went with quality over quantity, and at a price point of $80 US, this was still a good deal. Not just because of the pedigree of the selected games, but also because some of the more expensive picks. In particular, this whole package is cheaper than sourcing out a cartridge-only copy of Earthbound. With the positive response to these mini consoles, both from collectors and casual gaming fans, naturally, other developers want to capitalize on this market. Last year saw the release of the Sega Genesis Mini. Packed with 40 games, Sega was wise to pack in two controllers, and the cord length is about the same as the console's original controllers, so you can sit at a comfortable distance from your TV. The menu interface may be the weakest of these consoles, but it is still intuitive, and you can select how you want to organize them but I prefer the closer look at the art like the Nintendo ones provide. The music is fun and goes through movements capturing many different moods of Genesis games. Exiting games is the least intuitive, as you need to hold down the start button for several seconds to exit to a menu. You get used to it, but it's not as fast as I'd like. There are so many great games on this mini console, but with a bit more filler than the Nintendo releases, but I do prefer to have the variety personally. Staples like Sonic the Hedgehog 1 and 2 are of course present, as well as classics like Gunstar Heroes, Streets of Rage 2, Castle of Illusion, Castlevania Bloodlines, Comics Zone, and many, many more. Building off the SNES Classic's big move of releasing previously unreleased games, there are two such games. Darius, a shooter that never made it to the Genesis, and Tetris, which was long denied from the Genesis thanks to Nintendo having console distribution rights back in the day. Thankfully, this version of Tetris has two-player compatibility, something that the NES port lacked. There are some region-exclusive games that were released on the Mega Drive that did not originally end up in North America, like the PAL-released Mega Man The Wily Wars and the Japanese-exclusive Monster World 4. The allure of these titles is not only do they have an intimidating price tag, but they are also excellent games. While about the same as the Nintendo Mini Consoles are costing about $80, it is made more available so there is far less price gouging from eBay sellers. In fact, it has actually gone down in price depending on the retailer. For my money, this collection is more worthwhile than the Nintendo consoles and reminded many Sega fans why they were on Team Genesis back during the 16-bit wars. Despite the impressive collection on here, there are still plenty of games that I'd love to see added. Tragically, Sonic 3 and Knuckles is not on here, which seems like a no-brainer to me. Even the Nintendo Classic had all three Mario games. 
Other great titles that are missing are Rystar and Rocket Knight Adventures. Alien Soldier hadn't made it to the Genesis in North America, so this would have been another great way to get this gem from Treasure to a wider audience. It was odd to omit Aladdin since it was one of the best selling games on the system, even though they managed to license other Disney games. It was strange that they did not include Phantasy Star 2 despite many considering it a series highlight and a much loved RPG on the console. And oddly, no Mortal Kombat games are present despite those games being every Sega fanboy's go-to example of why Genesis does what Nintendo don't. And to counter Nintendo's Zelda games, having Crusader of Sentia on this would scratch that itch and relieve Sega fans of the hefty price tag that the original cartridge goes for. One of the downsides feels almost petty as the box it came in is less practical than the other boxes on this list, so if you unpack your console it may be hard to pack it back in, which just hasn't been an issue with the Nintendo counterparts. It seems like not much until you need to transport it and you find you can't close the box. But I am just being picky at this point. This year saw the mini console release that I was least expecting, the TurboGrafx-16 Mini. Konami put this collection together and unlike all the other consoles, the games are universal no matter what region you're in. You can choose either the TurboGrafx-16 or the Japanese PC Engine version, with some overlapping games, but many that were exclusive to Japan. The North American market gets the better deal since the PC Engine was much more successful than its North American counterpart, so there were far more Japanese exclusive games than the other consoles. This collection has many TurboGrafx staples like Blazing Lasers, Dungeon Explorer, Newtopia 1 and 2, Alien Crush, East Book 1 and 2, Bonk's Revenge, Air Zonk, and lots, lots more. When you switch to the PC Engine, you get a few other classics like Bonk's Adventure or PC Genjin, Fantasy Zone, Bomberman 94, and a bunch of others that I dare not try to pronounce. The big winner here is the Castlevania game Rondo of Blood, which is a much sought after game and one of the best regarded Castlevania games in a beloved series. While this is by far the biggest collection of games for a mini console at 57 games, Unless you speak both Japanese and English, you won't be able to play them all, as the PC Engine games have not been localized. This isn't always a huge deal because many of the games are shoot 'em ups and have very little text and are easy to pick up and play regardless, but other games like Snatcher are text heavy, and so you're out of luck. Regardless, this is a fantastic collection and going for about $100 US. This is a steal given how much more expensive collecting for the Turbo Graphics is these days. Not to mention that some of these games are from the Turbo CD add-on, which adds more cost to a collector of the original copies. It's not a perfect package, though. A strange item missing from this is a proper power adapter for you to plug your console in for power. It's an easy part to find, though, as you probably have some around your home, either to charge your phone or from your other mini consoles. But regardless, it's an extra step that I feel shouldn't have been an issue. Another problem is that it only comes with one controller when many of these games are multiplayer, with some up to even five players. And while there is only the one controller, it has enough cord for two. I guess they heard the criticism of the NES Classics cord and decided to overcompensate. It is the least complete feeling packages you need to source out the power supply, another controller, and potentially a turbo tap for more controller access. Though the last one is only if you really want to go hardcore. It is noticeably bigger than the other mini console, so it doesn't save you as much space as you might think. The menu and the interface is my favorite, with the large pictures and the ability to select whether you want the TurboGrafx-16 or the PC Engine games. The TurboGrafx music is the best of all the menu music, and we get lots of visual embellishments to really complete the experience, like the games being plugged in by hue cards or by CD. These flourishes really push the console to the next level of touching those nostalgic sweet spots. Exiting games in play is done simply by pressing both the run and select buttons simultaneously. One of the downsides of the console is lack of retail availability, partnering exclusively through Amazon. So if you're like me and don't really want to give Jeff Bezos your money, you may have no other option. I was lucky in that I got mine through eBay, but it did cost a bit more, though thankfully not as much as most of these consoles are going for through that secondary market. Still, I can't argue with the game selection and the overall quality of its interface. 
The nuts and bolts make this one of the best mini releases I've seen. Alien Crush is a great choice as it is a fantastic pinball game, but it is a shame that the less common and arguably better Devil's Crush didn't make the cut. It's also strange not to see the Legendary Axe games, if not both then at least the first one, as it was an important launch release for the system. Strangely absent is Keith Courage in Alpha Zones, the original pack-in title for the system. While it's not an amazing game, it seems like one that most old-school TurboGrafx-16 fans would be very nostalgic for. And I would have appreciated the third Bonk game because it's a late release for the console, and now a very expensive game to purchase. And even though there are plenty of shooters on this console, Gate of Thunder's absence feels like a huge oversight. But given the large game selection, I feel greedy for asking for too much more. Okay, so we're going to actually have a look at the numbers of how much these carts cost on their own and how much that costs totals and um, how much that is versus, of course, the actual mini console. I got these numbers off of pricecharting.com. Now that's where you could just put in the name of a game and it'll tell you how much it is in the market. I find that their numbers tend to be very conservative and they actually tend to cost a little bit more when you actually find them in the wild, but it does give you a sort of a general outline as to which games are particularly valuable and which ones are super easy and cheap to find. So even though I am Canadian, I'm using American dollars just because I think most of my audience is American. It also just fits with all of the other numbers that that I put out already about how much the mini consoles go for, so I may as well keep it consistent. None of these are complete in box or anything like that, which drastically increases the value. So this is sort of the bare minimum of you if you just got the cartridges, not counting the NES hardware. So as you see with the NES Mini, there are very few heavy hitters. Donkey Kong is the heaviest hitter at $29. Everything else is a little bit lower than that. The next most expensive down looks to be Castlevania. The cheapest one, no surprise, is uh, Super Mario Brothers, and that's me counting the Super Mario Brothers Duck Hunt combo, because that's actually more common than the regular Super Mario Brothers on its own. Most people will probably have that one. It is tied with Dr. Mario, which is also a very common game out there. So the total of all these numbers added up is $469. If you were to source out all of these games because you wanted every single one of these, it saves you over $400. So if you have a lot of these games, it may or may not be worthwhile to get the Nintendo Classic. So now looking at the numbers of the Super Nintendo Classic, although fewer games, they are consistently more expensive. So that's just something to be aware of, that the, the market for Super Nintendo games is a little pricier. Surprisingly, Super Mario World is not the cheapest cartridge. In fact, F-Zero is another launch title, which is not actually too surprising. There are lots of F-Zeros out there, so that is at $12. And curiously enough, Star Fox is at that $12 price point as well. The uh, most expensive cartridge by quite a lot is Earthbound at $160. I've seen it for far greater than that. Again, just the Earthbound cartridge, the SNES Classic costs less than that. The next one down is quite a leap down and looks to be Super Mario RPG, which I've also seen in the wild going for well over that $62 price point. So all of these cards added up does equal $734. So there you go. Although the SNES Classic is a little pricier, the value of the games is actually significantly more than the NES Classic. The Genesis cartridges are all over the place. Some of these are really cheap and some of these are quite expensive. So it looks like the cheapest cartridges, uh, Sonic Spinball, not too surprising because it's not a well-loved game, but it was very popular at the time because it has Sonic's name on it. So anything with Sonic on it sold well. So there's lots of them out there, but it isn't particularly well loved because of how hard it is. And also Columns at $5 as well, which makes sense because Columns is just a very simple puzzle game. There are two heavy hitters in particular that really make this bundle worth it. One of them is Mega Man The Wily Wars, which is at $104. And also keep in mind that that is PAL region, which means that it probably will not be able to plug into your North American Genesis, so you'd have to source out a PAL region Sega Mega Drive. So even if you get the game, you can't necessarily play the game. And that is the same for the Japanese exclusive Monster World 4, which is even more at $127. All of these put together equals a total of $1,041. Not bad. So getting to the numbers of the TurboGrafx-16, this one is a little trickier because a lot of these games I couldn't even find on pricecharting.com because they aren't released in North America at all. When I couldn't find them there, 
I did go to eBay to see if I could find copies there and just sort of did my best to get a general, very vague number of how much they were going for, usually on the more conservative side of things. So the ones that are charging a lot, there are sellers who are charging way more than what I put down. I also did not include double games. So if Newtopia 1 and 2, I didn't do the Japanese version alongside the English version. I just went through with the English version. I also went with the English version of some games like the Kung Fu, which was China Warrior. And again, this is just the hue cards. This is uh, not counting all the packaging and stuff like that, except for a few of these, which seem to only be available with packaging. So again, that sort of weighed into why this is the number I am the least sure of. This is also not counting any of those CD add-ons or uh, region adapters or anything like that. This is just the games. However, I think it does illustrate how much some of these are worth. All of these are consistently worth well more than the cartridges from the other consoles. There are a few cheaper ones, but it looks like uh, the absolute cheapest Jaseken Necromancer at $5. So that's interesting because that is a Japanese exclusive one. Um, and there's nothing else quite that cheap on here. Uh, the next one up is Momotaro Densetsu 2, I hope I'm saying that right, at $10. But it, you can see definitely the wide disparity between uh, some of the cheap ones and then the more expensive ones. I was actually surprised to find that Castlevania Rondo of Blood was not the most expensive, although it is the second highest at $250 for that CD. I do know that that is a very valuable, very sought after game. Um, but surprisingly, the most expensive game is is very expensive. This is a very conservative estimate, and I don't exactly know how to say it, so I'm gonna really mess this up, but Ginja Fuke Densetsu Sapphire at $1,500. So there you go. The vague estimate of how much this all costs is $4,852. It's also worth noting that uh, Genji and Heike clans, again, I don't know how, if I'm saying that right, I'm probably not. I could not find a price for that anywhere. I could not find a copy of it at all. So there isn't an unaccounted for number in there. But that really highlights if you don't have these games and are interested in them, how great a value this TurboGrafx-16 Mini is. So those are the numbers. Also something I noticed here is that there are actually only two game franchises to get representation on every one of these mini consoles, and that's Castlevania and Ghouls and Ghosts. Not really sure what to add to that, but it was just an observation. So should you get these mini consoles, and which ones should you get? If you just like collecting these mini consoles, then yes. Just yes. If you have all of these consoles, and all of the games you want to play, then you may not need to unless the save states are a big selling point. If you're looking for a fast and easy way to play a handful of retro games and you don't really have most of these games, then yes. If you are an OG console purist and emulation offends you, then no. If these are not 100% perfect, there is some delay in the sound effects and sometimes even the input, but that's just by a few frames. The average gamer will not notice or care, but you know who you are if that sounds like a deal breaker to you. Chances are that if you want to try new games, you'll have the most luck on the TurboGrafx-16 Mini and maybe the Genesis. The two Nintendo consoles are really the greatest hits, so don't expect tons of unfamiliar content on them. For me, I feel like they are all worth the money I paid for them at their original retail value. The secondhand market for the Nintendo ones, well, that I would hesitate on. I, as a rule of thumb, have no interest in feeding the scalpers. But keep an eye out for good deals. If you go just by the numbers of how much the games are worth, the obvious winner of these is the TurboGrafx-16 Mini, which has the most games and the best dollar value. But of course, personal favorites aren't based on numbers. Some people see more value in the nostalgia of the consoles and mainly want to play their favorites that they had when they were a kid. So what you want may depend on which console was dearest to your heart when you were growing up. On that logic, the SNES Classic would be my choice. But I'm looking for a lot of old games that I hadn't had the chance to play before. Based on the mix of familiar games and ones that I've been eager to play, my favorite of these consoles may actually be the Genesis Mini, but it is a tough call. Each of these are full of retro gaming classics and will demand hours of your time, and were clearly made by people who wanted to preserve a collection of games that helped make each of these consoles special. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope it was informative and helpful to your mini console purchasing decisions. Which of these consoles is your favorite? Please let us know in the comments down below and we'll talk about it a little bit. Please like and subscribe, it goes a long way to helping the channel out. Happy gaming!